Okay, I've got noon on my clock. So I think we're going to get started. We still have some folks joining us. I'm Bob Sadler, Communications Manager for Motor Cities National Heritage Area. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Motor Cities on the Road. This is our rebranded uh, program previously known as Motor Cities at Home. Uh, this is our 23rd program in the series. And we have gone back to the future today. Uh, one of our previous speakers, in fact, uh, one who presented our, ver our second program in the series is back. And uh, Russ DeRay will be presenting Walter Chrysler, his company and his life. Um, we're going to join Russ in just a few minutes. But while we have people continuing to, to join us, I'm going to give a short introduction for those of you that are new to Motor City's National Heritage Area. I want to give a, a, a quick overview of who we are, our mission, and a little bit of uh, what we do. So without any further ado, let's first thank our 2022 sponsors for Motor City's programming. They are the United Wor Auto Workers International Union and Don Nicholson Enterprises. And so we wanted to just take a moment to thank them for their support of Motor Cities. Motor Cities was established in 1998, which means we are just about to celebrate our 25th anniversary in 2023. So stay tuned for some fun stuff coming up next year. We are, of course, a nonprofit corporation and affiliated with the National Park Service. There are actually 55 different national heritage areas around the country, and each one is devoted to a specific aspect of our nation's heritage. Of course, here in Michigan, we're all about the automobile. And so our mission is to preserve interpret and promote the region's rich automotive and labor heritage. And we also enable and support and respect our area's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you can see on this slide, our founding partners include the big three automakers, as well as the UAW International Union, and of course, the National Park Service. Our footprint, is 10,000 square miles of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. That's 16 counties. And it just doesn't include Metro Detroit. It includes other motor cities like Flint and Saginaw and the capital area around Lansing and goes all the way west out to Kalamazoo where they made yellow cabs. And of course, the Western gateway to the National Heritage Area is the Gilmore Car Museum in Hickory Corners. Hopefully, most all of you, they've been up for about three years now, but have seen uh, 15 of our highway signs that welcome people to our National Heritage Area. And hopefully that program will expand and hopefully double in the next few years. Uh, we've noticed a great deal of an increase in awareness and uh, certainly more people are engaging with us on our social media and using our website. Uh, so these highway signs have been a very positive development of the last few years uh, in the National Heritage Area. And finally, a couple things that are new. You may have heard that uh, we recently moved out of the Renaissance Center, which was our home for about 14 years, and moved to a co-working space since we're uh, still working on a hybrid uh, model. Uh, and aren't necessarily in the office five days a week. Uh, we've moved to uh, a place called Chroma Detroit on East Grand Boulevard, uh, just east of Woodward, and not far from the original General Motors headquarters in the new center area, also uh, a couple blocks north of the Ford Paquette Avenue plant. And so that's our, our, our new home. And also, we also launched uh, earlier this year our Junior Ranger program, which is a program that uh, Russ Doré, our speaker today, uh, was involved in, in developing and uh, uh, also uh, testing out uh, before we went live with it. 
And so the Junior Ranger program is targeted towards uh, school age children and uh, gives them a taste of automotive history and uh, allows some for some experiential learning. And uh, so we certainly hope that you'll uh, take a look for your kids, your grandkids. Uh, the Junior Ranger program is available right on our website. And uh, we hope you'll uh, enjoy it. There are a number of ways to interact with us, including MotorCities.org, our website. Every Wednesday, we put out an e-newsletter called You Auto Know. And uh, those folks uh, who got that receive that newsletter uh, every Wednesday morning. And it has lots of information, our story of the week, events that are coming up in the National Heritage Area. And it's real easy to sign up for. Uh, right on our homepage at the lower portion, there's a sign up for our e-newsletter um, button that you can click on and you can get that newsletter every week for free. Also, you might want to check out our, our Facebook, our Twitter. We've got a, a very robust YouTube page with lots of great videos and, and all of the videos of these programs, these Motor Cities on the Road series are all posted on our YouTube page. So you can go back and check on some of the programs you may have missed. And we also uh, are on Instagram. And if you really like what we do and wanna support our mission, you can support us by becoming a member. And membership does have its privileges. There are a number of uh, admission and gift shop discounts for about uh, 14 of our 15 of our partner attractions included with membership uh, to Motor Cities National Heritage Area. And if you just want to donate anytime, uh, you can go to our support page and make a donation via Network for Good. And we thank you for your support. Now, without any further ado, it's time to introduce our guest speaker. He is Russ Doré. He is a board member of our Motor Cities National Heritage Area, as well as a member of the Northville Historical Society, where he resides, and a member of the Henry Ford Heritage Association. He holds bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in the social sciences from Michigan State University, Go Green, and the University of Washington. His company, Dore Productions, has been making the past come alive for audiences for over 20 years. And like I said, he was our second speaker in our original Motor Cities at Home series, talking about Billy Durant and the founding of General Motors. And today he's going to be talking about Walter Chrysler and the company that bears his name. Without any further ado, I little, it's my pleasure to give you Mr. Russ Dore. So please unmute and get started. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's uh, a little bit of snow here in Northville, Michigan. I don't know where you're watching from, but uh, uh, there are some advantages to this Zoom uh, technique where we don't have to fight the elements. Uh, me as a speaker or you as an audience. So uh, real, real pleased for you to be here. As Bob said, uh, Motor Cities has done programs on Henry Ford, and I did one on uh, Billy Durant, and now we're going to take a look at the other founder of the big three, Walter Chrysler. And out of the hundreds of automobile companies, uh, these, these three pioneers made it to the top. And so uh, uh, they're really worth understanding their backgrounds. So uh, let's, let's take a look. Walter uh, Percy Chrysler was born April 2nd, 1875 in Wamego, Kansas, and he grew up in Ellis, Kansas. He was the son of Henry and Anna Marie. Chrysler. He was the third of four children. Both his parents were German ancestry. His father was a locomotive engineer. He was born in Canada. His mother was born in Missouri. Well, he dropped out of high school his last year, and he worked for railroads as an apprentice, a mechanic, and then supervisor for various railroads. He later obtained a mechanical degree from the International Correspondence Schools, and that was the extent of his formal education. He played tuba in bands, including the Union Pacific Band, and also played on the company baseball team. He's kind of a well-rounded guy. His boss on one job sent him a sharp note regarding a mistake he had made. 
Walter sent an equally prickly note right back. The boss called him in and said, if you had put a letter in a drawer for three or four days, you would have dealt with it more soundly. You would have been fair to me and fair to yourself. Don't you see? Now, boy, remember what I've said to you. Well, from that day on, Walter never answered a letter when he was angry. And he was known to uh, have a bit of a temper. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to advance my slides here. Um, I'm, I'm not able to advance them. I think okay. I had to exit slide. out of full screen and yeah. just use your PowerPoint. You should be able to advance them. Yeah, I think I um, had this problem one other time. Uh, so just stop the show first or go up to go up to the top and okay. exit full screen for your view of zoom and okay. then you can you can should be able to see your your powerpoint and be able to advance it that way um, upper right corner yeah exit full screen and you should still have it on the majority of your screen, but you should have your PowerPoint visible enough to be able to advance it. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry about this uh, screen. Well, actually, what's the best click next? You should be able to. I'm not getting exit full screen thing here. That's okay. Just hit next. Hit next okay. right there. Oh, okay. Okay. And then you'll have That'd to do that. It. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, now, let's get back my screen view here. Okay. Are we all set then? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I uh, apologize for that. Well, uh, Walter attended the Chicago Automobile Show in 1908. And he bought a locomobile automobile for $4,500. He borrowed 4000 of it. His wife wasn't too pleased. He recounted, she did not scold me. But it did seem that when she closed the kitchen door, it made a little more noise than usual. Maybe she slammed it. And on top of that, he took it apart to study it. He didn't drive it for three months. He bought it just because it was this new technology. At age 36, he became works manager for the American Locomotive Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 1911, he was hired as works manager at Buick Division of General Motors, Flint, for $6,000 a year. Now, the locomotive company said they didn't want to lose him because the management talent was very scarce. So they said, uh, what are they going to pay you there? And he said, same as here, uh, $6,000. They said, we'll pay you $12,000 to stay. He thought it over and he said, no, I'm probably about as far as I can go in my education in this big industry, but I want to get in on the bottom of the, this new automotive industry. And he obviously made the right, uh, right decision there. Well, he was supported, uh, he supported the Buick soccer team. He's shown in the center here. And some people say, uh, why soccer, not baseball or football? Well, David Buick, the founder of Buick, was a, a British so that that may explain why they had a soccer team. Well, he improved the operations uh, and profits. The first week he found out that from one to four cars a week were taken out for a test drive and never returned. He set up a registration system and saved the company much of his first year's salary. Uh, some of you may remember that the Ford Wixom plant had that problem a few years ago. Uh, People uh, driving out of there with Lincolns and, uh, and for testing and never returned. I don't know if they uh, picked that up by reading history of Walter Chrysler or not. Well, anyway, uh, when Billy Durant was pushed out as president of General Motors in 1910, Charlie Nash was made president of GM and Walter was promoted to president of Buick Division. After three years, Walter asked for a salary of $25,000 a year. Remember, he had come in at six and said he would need 50,000 the following year. 
Well, Nash knew again that man manufacturing talent was very uh, rare and agreed to it. Well, then when Billy Durant returned to GM as president in 1916, Charlie Nash left to take over the Thomas Jeffrey Company in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which he then named after himself, uh, Charlie Motors, right? <laughs> Just seeing if you're with me. So that's where Nash Motors was founded. Walter planned to join him and submitted his resignation to GM. Billy Durant took a night train to Flint, showed up in Walter's office and offered him $500,000 a year to stay as president of Buick for three more years. Walter accepted with the provision that he had full authority and that Durant would not go directly to anyone in Buick but him with any big decisions. Well, Durant was not good at delegating. In 1919, Walter was negotiating with A.O. Smith Company in Milwaukee to manufacture Buick frames there. So he went to a Flint Chamber of Commerce meeting and the president of the chamber, Dallas Dort, who was Durant's former partner in carriage business, announced proudly that he had just received a wire from Durant that they were building a $6 million plan in Flint to manufacture Buick frames. So the next day, Chrysler let him have it with both barrels at the GM board meeting. He pointed out the plant would take two years to build. There was not even enough housing in Flint for the current employees who were living in tent cities and that they could save the company a million and a half a year by buying the frames from A.O. Smith. Well, the plant was never built. The frames were purchased from A.O. Smith. But Walter knew that Durant uh, may never forgive him for that heated opposition. Well, because of those and other uh, disputes, Walter left GM in 1919, the end of his three years, with $10 million from the sale of his GM stock. He was 44 years old, rich, and had no job. So he's hired as a general manager to try to turn around a failing Willie's Overland Company in Toledo, Ohio, at a salary of a million dollars a year for two years. One of the first things he did, he called John Willie's in and uh, talked and, and said, I'm cutting your salary from 150,000 a year to 75,000. Now this is the founder of the company. Uh, Willie says, well, you know, I, I, you really shouldn't do that or can't do that. And uh, Chrysler said, look, if you're worth 150,000 a year, I wouldn't be here. Uh, late in 1921, at a meeting to discuss renewing his contract, the bankers who hired him complained about his salary. He said, if that's the way you feel, you can stick this job. So uh, he had a lot of pride. He joined the Maxwell Company and he did leave. So then he joined the Maxwell Company founded by Ben Briscoe and Jonathan Maxwell who helped start Buick years earlier. Some of you may remember uh, the Maxwell. The 1916 Model 25 touring car was famous as the car that Jack Benny drove for decades after it had stopped being manufactured. Supposedly, he was too stingy to buy a new car as long as his old one ran. When a technical fault prevented the car sounds from being played, voice actor Mel Blank improvised and then continued to do the car sounds. Mel Blank, you may know, was the voice of Bugs Bunny. Three engineers, Fred Zader, Owen Skelton, and Carl Breen, had left Studebaker to join Willie's. Then when Walter left Willie's, they went left to form a consulting company to work with Walter. They worked with Maxwell and designed a Chrysler 6 model for the Maxwell company. Walter said to them, these three young automotive engineers were wizards. You never would find high or low three friends more harmoniously attuned, unless it might be those men of fiction, the three musketeers. And this is how they were referred to for many years. This was the first car with a Chrysler nameplate, but remember it was still a Maxwell company model. Walter personally exhibited at the 1924 New York Auto Show in the lobby of the Commodore Hotel. That's because it didn't qualify for the auto show because it hadn't been produced yet in quantity. So it, he rented some space in the lobby of the Commodore Hotel and on his own uh, uh, marketed it there. It was touted as quieter, smoother, and quicker than anything in its price range of around $1,600 to $2,000. Uh, the company said it gave the thrills of a $5,000 car. Car was well received, orders rolled in. The Chrysler model soon outsold the Maxwell model. 
1925, the three most profitable cars were Maxwell with 40%, GM with 35%, and Ford with 25% profit margin. Well, Maxwell had a legal problem with the stock caused by a reorganization back in 1921. So in June of 25, they formed a new company, Chrysler Corporation, and traded Maxwell stock for Chrysler stock. Now, the first president of Chrysler Corporation was not Walter Chrysler but his attorney, Nicholas Keller. See, there was a legal restriction which prevented Walter from serving as president of both Maxwell and Chrysler. So the stockholders then dissolved Maxwell, transferred all the stock to Chrysler. And after 18 days, Kelly stepped down and Walter became president of Chrysler. So if you want some trivia, uh, you can ask people about this, but the first Chrysler car was not made by the Chrysler Corporation and the first president of the Chrysler Corporation was not Walter Chrysler. The Chrysler logo resembled a blue ribbon prize awarded at county fairs. It included wings, which were to indicate speed. The modified wings are still part of the Chrysler logo. 1926, the Chrysler 6 was based heavily on the Maxwell, but was now a Chrysler Corporation model. They also came out with a new six-cylinder Imperial in 1926. The first actual new model offered by Chrysler Corporation was a model 58. Go 58 miles an hour, go from five miles an hour to 25 miles an hour in eight seconds. It sold for $500 less than the Chrysler 6. Now, Walter went to Europe, came back with 40 agencies in France, 32 in England, and three in Germany. A fellow named K.T. Keller joined the company in 1926 as vice president of manufacturing. He had headed up GM of Canada. Walter had kept an eye on him from their days together at GM. Keller was a hands-on guy like Walter and had come up through the ranks. He also came out with a new model 50, which had an all steel body, which reduced the weight and reduced the price to $750. In 1927, they came out with a luxury car, the Imperial L80, with a top speed of 80 miles an hour. Sometimes the last number in the uh, name of the car indicates the top speed. Plymouth brand was added in 1928 to compete with Ford and Chevrolet. It sold for $670, which was 50% more than the two competitors, yet it was well received. I have... Uh, a shirt, uh, uh, and I gave this presentation to a Chrysler owners uh, group that met here in the Detroit area in uh, 2018. I'm going to tip my uh, uh, screen down a little bit so you can see it. So that, anyway, that's where I uh, got this Chrysler shirt. Now, of course, the Chrysler brand is no longer there, um, no longer in existence. Make sure I get my screen back up there. Then the DeSoto brand was added in 1928 to, uh, for the market between the Chrysler and the lower priced Plymouth, and it did very well. Well, in 1928, he purchased the Dodge Company. The founders, John and Horace Dodge, had died, and it was run by their widows until the Dillon Reed investment firm bought it. Clarence Dillon had tried to sell it to Walter, but his terms were too high. Walter wanted it really mostly for the plant capacity the Dodge had, which he needed for his uh, new cars, the Plymouth and the DeSoto. Finally, they holed up in a suite at the Ritz Hotel in New York and negotiated for five days. They agreed on the terms that Dillon had to bring in 90% of the Dodge stock in two months by July 31st, 1928, and they brought it in in the last uh, day, and the deal was done. Uh, I also have a, uh, a Dodge uh, memento. I have a, a Dodge Cup which I got at uh, Meadowbrook a gift shop, as I recall, with the Dodge emblem on it. So KT Keller headed up the Dodge company division. Walter was happy that Dodge had given him new models, but more importantly, again, the plant capacity. By the end of 1928, Ford, GM, and Chrysler produced 90% of the total output of, of cars. The big three was born. Time Magazine 
honored him with a Man of the Year Award in 1928 for his accomplishments in building the major company. Now, the same year that he financed the construction of the Chrysler Building, and I'm sorry, the same year he financed the construction of the Chrysler Building in New York City, which was completed in 1930. For a few months, it was the tallest building in the world until the Empire State Building was erected. Now, he built this with his own funds. It was not a Chrysler Corporation project. He wanted his sons, Walter Jr. and Jack, to have a business outside the auto, automobile business. He once told a reporter, I was well aware that a rich man's sons are likely to be cheated of something. How could my boys ever know the wild incentive that burned in me from the time I first watched my father put his hand to the throttle of the engine? I could not give them that, but it was through this thinking that I conceived the idea of putting up a building. This building was to be 925 feet tall and surpassed the Woolworth building become the tallest occupied building in the world. His architect was William Van Allen. Well, they learned that Van Allen's former partner was designing another skyscraper in New York that would be taller than the Chrysler Building. Walter told Van Allen, you've just got to get up and do something. It looks like you're not going to be the tallest after all. So Van Allen came up with a solution. He designed a spire over 100 feet long and had it secretly constructed inside the frame of the building so the com competition wouldn't know about it. When it was finally added at the last minute, it brought the height to, to 1,046 feet. It made it the tallest building in the world, surpassing even the Eiffel Tower in Paris. <clears throat> this uh, always makes me kind of uncomfortable. Uh, the building had some touches that related to the automotive industry. On the 31st floor, the corner ornaments are replicas of the 1929 Chrysler radiator caps. The corners of the 61st floor are graced with eagles, the wings representing the Chrysler logo. Here are some workers taking a smoke break on one of the eagle heads. No OSHA uh, requirements in those days. So the completed building was 77 stories high. They had a private cloud club on the uh, 68th floor. Walter had an office on the 56th floor and an apartment on the 59th floor. The Chrysler Corporation rented offices in the building as did Texaco and Time Incorporated. Um, I've got a model of the, uh, I'm gonna pull this back. I've got a model of the Chrysler building here. It's a cardboard model that we found in a gift shop somewhere in our travels. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, you can see the, uh, the hubcaps uh, are, are here on the 30 something floor, and then the eagles up here, and then there's the, the spire at the top. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it's, the base is a little bit off center here. See, it's not uh, square. And I, I thought maybe we had done something wrong in putting the model together, and, and then I researched it, and I found out that uh, when they bought the land, there was an easement that the city had across there. And rather than argue with the city about whether they could build on that easement and later have it uh, become an issue, they just uh, slanted the building a bit so they didn't have to, to mess with that, uh, with that easement. Meanwhile, John Raskob had ideas for a competing building. He had been a vice president, early investor at General Motors. He had supported Democrat Al Smith for president in 1928, but uh, because uh, it was a Democrat, uh, GM didn't like that, so they forced him to resign. So he then decided to build the Empire State Building in New York. He definitely wanted his building to be taller than Chrysler's. Here's another un unnerving picture. Here's a photo of some of the workers showing off their golf skills during construction of the Empire State Building. Well, the Empire State Building was originally to be 77 stories, the same as the Chrysler Building. But when Chrysler added his spire, Raskob increased his design to 85 stories and even added a 158-foot spire just to be sure. So the Chrysler Building was the tallest building in the world for 11 months until the Empire State Building was finished in 1931. 
Chrysler Building is presently the 11th tallest building in New York City. The tallest is the One World Trade Center, but Chrysler is still the world's tallest brick building. Chrysler Building was sold by the family in 1953, owned by a lot of different people, and is now owned by an RFC holding company, an American company, a joint venture with an Austrian company. Well, back to the cars. This, in October 29, the stock market crashed. The entire economy went into a tailspin. Autos were hit very hard. In this photo, the sign on the car reads, $100 buys this car, must have cash. Lost all in the stock market. In 1930, Chrysler set up a welfare department to help employees with food, clothing, and other essentials. In 1931, they introduced the floating power feature in the Plymouth, which relocated the engine uh, brackets and used rubber engine mounts to greatly reduce vibration. They offered a six cylinder engine in this car. The floating power feature was heavily advertised and very helpful in sales. Chrysler also came out with a famous ad where Walter urged people to look at all three major brands before buying. This kind of reminds me of Lee Iacocca's Chrysler ad many years later that said, if you can find a better car, buy it. Well, they came out with some luxury cars. 1931, some of the most uh, beautiful designs, such as the Imperial CG. 31, Chrysler Imperial LeBaron. Uh, now this was built by the LeBaron Body Works on a Chrysler chassis, and that's many of the luxury cars in those days were built by uh, independent body makers like LeBaron and put on various chassis. By the end of 1933, Chrysler had outdistanced Ford and was number two behind GM. Ford had fallen behind by Henry clinging to his Model T long after the competition had developed improved features. A whole special issue of Fortune magazine in January 1934 was devoted to Walter Chrysler and his success with his company. Uh, not everything worked out for Walter. Here's his airflow model uh, introduced in 1934. He's got a model of it here. The airflow was inspired by streamlining in railroad design. The ads focused on the better gas mileage due to streamlining, but the airflow styling, however, was too radical a change for the general public, and it was a financial flop. It's interesting. It's a tough business. You have to be far enough ahead to uh, have people get excited, but if you're too far ahead, uh, they won't buy it. So the Airstream... Uh, all the running gears and everything were kept, but it was uh, modified in design and called the, I mean, the airflow was uh, renamed the Airstream and designed more conventionally, outsold the airflow five to one. It was produced in, 1930, in 1935 and 1936. Well, Walter retired as president in 1935 and promoted K.T. Keller. Walter Dole remained as chairman and CEO. Well, in 1937, United Auto Workers, which were part of the AFL at that time, decided to strike Chrysler. They had just signed a contract with GM and wanted to represent the workers at Chrysler. They wanted exclusive representation. Uh, in other words, if you worked there, you had to belong to the union. Chrysler would not consider that. So they initiated a sit-down strike as they had done at GM. Walter Chrysler and John L. Lewis, head of the AFL, personally negotiated the strike. It only lasted a few weeks compared to GM's longer strike. The contract was almost identical to the GM contract, and they did not have an exclusive closed shop. John L. Lewis praised Walter as a man of his word. Let's look a little bit at Walter's personal life. He married uh, Della Forker in 1901 in Ellis, Kansas, that time he was working for the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad in Salt Lake City, started their married life. He was making $3 a day as a mechanic. His daughter, Thelma Irene, was born in 1902. She married a fellow named Byron Cecil Foy in 1923. He had worked for Ford and was president 
a real motor car company in Los Angeles, uh, started by uh, Ransom Olds. He later became vice president of two major Chrysler dealerships and joined Chrysler Corporation in 1929, rose to high positions, and everyone said not due to his family uh, connections, but through real executive ability. Thelma was known for her extensive collection of Christian Dior dresses. A second daughter, Bernice, was born in uh, 1906. Walter Jr. was born in 1909 when Walter was working for the American Locomotive Company, Pittsburgh, at $275 a month as superintendent of the Allegheny Works. He became a Navy pilot in 1942 and an art collector, founded the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. So if you go to the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia, don't expect to see uh, automobiles. Rather, you're going to see art. The second son, Jack, was born in 1912. Walter's home in 1924 in Flint was somewhat modest for his income. However, about this time, he bought his luxurious home in Kings Point, Long Island. It was on the water and uh, had a place for his yacht. The entrance was two stories high with an overhanging balcony and hand-painted ceilings. Well, Walter's riches got him into trouble, and here she is. Peggy Hopkins Joyce was a showgirl whom Walter had an affair with in his early 30s, a rather public affair. She later had six husbands over the years. Walter gave her some $2 million in jewelry, including a 134 karat diamond on a necklace worth $500,000. He finally went back to his wife and Peggy went on to her six husbands. Walter was also involved during prohibition. Uh, he favored prohibition, even though he was a heavy social drinker. He later changed his position and spoke about ending it because of the related crime and gangland killings. 1932, he became general chairman of Crusaders Incorporated to raise money to support candidates for Congress who were opposed to prohibition. Well, prohibition ended, as you know, in 1933, pleased a lot of people, as you can see here. His wife, Della, died in 1938 at age 62 of a cerebral hemorrhage. Walter Chrysler died in 1940 at age 65 after a stroke two years earlier. They are buried in this mausoleum in Sleepy House Cemetery in Terrytown, New York. Um, I like to take uh, some of these uh, pioneers, and since Henry Ford is the icon of automotive uh, pioneering, uh, so take people like Billy Duran and Walter Chrysler and, and kind of do some similarities and differences with, with Henry Ford. Uh, so the similarities were they both viewed a positive automotive future. Uh, Walter, again, uh, took a $6,000 pay cut, if you will, because he could have doubled his salary uh, by staying. And uh, Henry Ford had a, such a positive view that he started a third company after failing in his first two companies. So they were both very positive about the future of the automotive industry. They were both successful at building a company into one of the big three. They kept their eyes on the target. They weren't the best of family men. Uh, Walter with his public affair and Henry Ford, uh, there's a lot written about him being tough on his son, Edsel. And there were rumors uh, of an affair in his life. How about some of the differences? Well, Walter was a manager. Uh, Ford was a tinker. Chrysler was uh, fairly flexible. Ford was quite stubborn as um, documented by his uh, failure to uh, build something new uh, to replace the Model T after the competition had moved on. Chrysler delegated to others. Henry was very authoritarian and uh, uh, including overriding his son, Edsel, in many cases. Uh, Chrysler was a social drinker. Henry was a teetotaler. What were some of their strengths? Well, Chrysler was the first to focus strongly on exterior design. Ford was the first to successfully use the auto assembly line in a big way. And again, 
uh, that really led him to 50% market share in the industry at one time. Chrysler, again, was creative artistically, and Ford was creative technically. Well, to sum up Walter Chrysler, he was uh, not an engineer uh, like Henry Ford or an organizer like Billy Durant, but he was a leader. Chrysler built with men, not with companies or machines, said Fred Zader, one of the three musketeers. One day at lunchtime, after meeting with other executives, uh, they asked if they should go down to the Book Cadillac Hotel for lunch. Walter said, no, we're going right here and pointed down the hall to the employee cafeteria where the assembly line workers were. There were five men in greasy overalls at a table. He walked over and said, hello, boys, I'm Walter Chrysler. Do you mind if I sit down? And he asked him for ideas about improving things. Someone who knew him well said he had a glittering personality with a rich railroad man's vocabulary, a short temper, and a showman's pride. He was a man who thoroughly enjoyed his hard-earned wealth but never lost his appreciation for the people who put the cars together with their hands. Well, let's look at Chrysler Corporation uh, recent history. Uh, again, many of you remember some of these highlights. Uh, Lee Iacocca was brought in as CEO in 1978 uh, after Henry the Deuce fired him at Ford. Uh, they got a US government loan guarantee in 1979. They paid it off in three years seven years early. And Chrysler purchased American Motors in 1987. Daimler-Benz purchased Chrysler in 1998. Uh, they were purchased by Cerebrus Capital in 2007. Uh, they went into bankruptcy in 2009 along with General Motors and uh, had a government bailout in 2009. Fiat bought controlling shares of Chrysler in 2011, bought the remainder in 2014 and renamed it FCA or Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. And they merged with um, Peugeot in uh, last year and uh, into a company that was formed called Stellantis. Uh, so that's where, uh, that's where uh, Chrysler fits. Now, what about some of the, the uh, uh, products that they have? Uh, well, most of the dealers now, or all the dealers, I guess, are they're called Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram dealers. Incidentally, uh, when they um, purchased American Motors back in 87, they got the Jeep brand, which was a, a big thing uh, for their future, it turned out. So... Uh, the products that they have now, Chrysler has a Pacifica van, a Chrysler 300. Those are their only two. But they have a uh, concept car called the Airflow. Remember the Airflow that flopped? Well, they're going to have an electric vehicle, and they've gone back and they picked up the Airflow uh, name for that uh, electric concept car. Uh, the Dodge, a part of the, the company, has a Charger, the Challenger, and the Durango. Uh, the trucks or the pickups spun off as a separate division, and that's Ram, and they have uh, pickups and trucks. And then, of course, they have the Jeep brand, uh, which has eight models. So there's still many models uh, from, the, uh, from the Chrysler uh, origin and history that are out there. And uh, so that's Walter. Uh, uh, I'm going to leave some time for uh, questions, but I just want to tell you a little about some of my programs. I have uh, PowerPoint programs like this on uh, Ford, Durant, have one on the four companies that were really good but didn't quite make it into the big three, Studebaker, Packard, Nash, and Hudson, Dodge Brothers, got a new one on electric cars, past, present, and future, and then uh, one on the autom uh, aircraft industry, the Wright Brothers, Bill Boeing and Donald Douglas. Uh, now, the next group are interactive presentations where we have actors portraying these. So we have Ford Edison Firestone, Ford Durant and Chrysler. My whole interest is in leadership beyond just automotive leadership. So we uh, branched out into some uh, political leaders, Franklin L. O. Roosevelt, Harry and Bess Truman, Joe and Rose Kennedy, Mark Twain and his wife, 
And right now we're doing Orville and Catherine Wright, and I portray uh, Orville. Here's one of our uh, pictures when we did Henry and Friends. Uh, Thomas Edison on the left looks strangely to, like me, and then we have Henry Ford in the center and uh, Harvey Firestone. I always give a plug at this point about Motor Cities and give quite a bit of the information that Bob gave earlier. Uh, so I'm not going to go into that, but I always uh, spend some time uh, talking about the value of Motor Cities. Uh, this year, my COVID project, I became an author. So I wrote a book called Motor City Drama, Behind the Scenes, Building the Big Three with Ford, Durant, and Chrysler. Uh, when I gave these presentations, people would say, do you have a book? And I said, you know, there are enough books on these three. What could I add? One person said, you talk about their early interactions. Why don't you do a historical fiction book where you uh, bring these people to life? And, and that's what I did. So uh, I have actual, where there were meetings and we know the outcome of the meeting from history. I take people inside the meeting and actually make up the conversation. And since we're talking about Walter Chrysler, uh, one of the conversations that, uh, that I have is uh, where he's arguing with Durant about uh, where to build that frame plant. And I go in and I make up the actual conversation. And I have another one where uh, Durant had a meeting in, with four people, including Henry Ford and uh, Ransom Olds trying to form General Motors and they almost did, but it didn't work. Uh, and so Ford might've been a branch of General Motors at that time, but I, again, I go inside the meeting and make up the conversation, bring these people to life in line with the history that I've uh, that I'm researched. So they're fun, they're fun books. And I've got another one on the aircraft industry similar. Uh, you can get them on Amazon, good Christmas present, uh, 10 bucks. Uh, if you wanna get a hold of me uh, anytime I can autograph them. Okay, uh, I have a website, Doré Productions, uh, dot weebly com, where I post my public presentations. So uh, if you want to know about any of my uh, public presentations, you can always go there. Or if you want to know where to find my books, uh, and uh, you can go there. And at this point, we'll just open it up to any questions and answers on Walter Chrysler. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Russ, for sharing uh, the story of Walter Chrysler. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a really great and rich story um so one question i i mean i know you mentioned the airflow and, and the airflow is frankly it's still revered to this day as one of the most innovative designs ever in the automotive industry um and it's amazing uh when you think about it that that it that it did flop like it did um and i saw the pictures of the difference between the airflow and the subsequent airstream um why? Why do you think it just was too too ahead of its time, or or, or well, why yeah, think just, it just think about this. You know, you're you're thinking of buying a car. Well, let's take the uh, let's uh, let's take the Tesla truck. If you've seen pictures of that, you know, it looks like a flying wedge, right? Uh, so you're thinking of buying a truck. You know, would you and you want to let's say an electric vehicle pickup type. The, the Tesla truck is really, really different. And, and I, I would think one of the considerations somebody would make is, wow, you know, uh, I like the looks of it, but gosh, I don't know what the resale will be, or I don't know if other people will like it. You know, I, I yeah, maybe it'll fold, maybe it won't, you know, sell and I can't get parts. I don't know. I, I just pass. I guess that's kind of, kind of what probably happened in people's thinking. Mm-hmm. And certainly, if 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 any of you uh, watching have a question, uh, feel free to use the Q and A function that is uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we just we just received our our first question. Um, Florian uh, asks, "Did any of Walter's children or grandchildren follow him into the automotive business?" Uh, no, <laughs> as far as I know, as far as I recall, yeah. No, they didn't. The uh, I, I I don't know much about the the other son, uh, but uh, the one became an art collector. You know, he he just uh, and of course they had that building, uh, so they had money. <laughs> they, they they ran the building. 
uh, and then sold it. So, uh, you know, by that time, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, but no, no, neither one of them had, had this burning desire to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, something that I was thinking about um, that I didn't see in the presentation, I'm wondering about your research of Walter mm -hmm. Chrysler. Um, I know that for many years, they were headquartered in Highland Park. And um, I don't know, was that something that happened during Walter Chrysler's era? Or was that something that came later under Keller? Um, mm -hmm. and, and why Chrysler yeah. ended up in Highland Park, if you, if you had uh, any idea about that? No, no, no I don't remember. Uh, they, they had plants in Detroit, of course. Uh, and um, then they had the, uh, they rented some space out in the Chrysler building, <laughs> even though they didn't own it, they rented space from Walter. Uh, as the landlord to have uh, a presence in, in New York. And, uh, and Billy Durant moved out to New York too uh, when he was uh, president of GM in, in his last years of being president there. So, um, and then of course, um, um, when, uh, when it was um, a Fiat Chrysler, they, they were uh, headquartered in the Netherlands because of, uh, Tax for tax purposes. So, and I'm not sure where Stellantis is headquartered. Uh, I think in, uh, in France. France, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, it's interesting to kind of speculate and think about, you know, what might have happened. And, you know, you mentioned um, Charles Nash and uh, how when he left General Motors and uh, moved to Wisconsin and purchased that company and, and created what, be, what became Nash Motors. And of course, we know the rest of the history, you know, Nash ultimately ended up being part of American Motors, mm -hmm. which ultimately ended up being part of Chrysler. So right. it's kind of funny how that family tree um, kind of works with, uh, with that. I wonder how things might've been different if, if Chrysler had joined Nash. Yeah, and would any of this have actually happened? Well, uh, and again, with Walter's uh, manufacturing expertise and, and people skills, uh, Nash might have been a, a much bigger. Uh, and and I I have a presentation on that, and I, I haven't refreshed myself on it. But you know, there were there were uh, um, two mergers that went on in there. Uh, uh, they wanted to merge all four: Packard, Dash, Hudson, and um, what was the other one? Studebaker. Yeah, mm -hmm. they wanted to merge all of those at one time, which would have been a major, major uh, thrust. But uh, um, the right. president of Packard didn't didn't want to. He he insisted on being CEO, as I recall, and and wouldn't wouldn't join in, and so just Packard. What well, was Packard and Studebaker? Right? Packard and Studebaker came together, and Nash and Hudson came together. Came together. But they all four of them might have come together if if the president of Packard would have uh, decided to, um, uh, you know, let somebody else be CEO. Right. Because of his insistence, you kind of get a feeling of his personality. Maybe why they didn't want him as CEO. Mm -hmm. Not fair. I probably get a nasty note from some relative right again if if you have a question and you want to uh, uh put it out there feel free to use the uh, q a uh, function at the bottom of your screen um we also are, are live on facebook uh so thanks again russ for uh sharing your uh, expertise with us about walter chrysler uh i will note that uh this is the final Motor Cities on the Road presentation for 2022. And uh, we ask you to uh, stay tuned for uh, what we've got coming in, in 2023. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. We hope you enjoyed Motor Cities on the Road with uh, Walter Chrysler and Russ Duray. And uh, we ask you to go out and make it a great Wednesday. Thanks again, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.